Good morning. Some have said that this is a day in which we should be glad and rest in it. And these days feel like there's a little bit of consternation, there's hurricane, there are winds, there is fire. There are political conventions, there are speeches, and yet we gather on a day when we ask for rest and gladness. We gather on a day when we know that no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. We gather on a day knowing that we seek out the presence of God to lead and guide us and also to comfort us. On this day, let us worship God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I would invite you to join in as we say the call to worship. We who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. Seek God here. We who come to be inspired and changed. Seek Seek God's God's Spirit Spirit here. here. We who know how little we know. Seek Seek God's God's Word here. here. Let us join together as we sing the two verses of Break Now the Bread of Life. As we seek to gather in the presence of the holy, we are reminded to ground ourselves, to take off our shoes, to center ourselves. We take time in which we afford you the opportunity to simply close your eyes, to breathe in and to breathe out, and to allow that Spirit of God to dwell within and around you.
God, you are made known to us in the rustling wind that blows, in the blazing fire that does not consume, in the face of the good, in the deep of the unknown. We meet you here. We accept your greeting. We welcome your inspiration. We await the change you have in store for us. Draw us into you. Inhabit our spirits. Focus our attention. Bring us to you, you who are already with us. Help us to be as you would have us be. Through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, here and everywhere, now and always. Amen. Amen. As we prepare for confession, let us consider questions inspired by the Apostle Paul. Is our love always genuine? Do we resist the evil we see? Do we consistently seek to serve God? Are we hospitable to strangers? Do we offer blessings to our enemies? Do we even know what this means? Do we have close relationships with people who are really different from us? Do we seek revenge on those who have wronged us? Good friends, we do these things. We do them often, maybe not all at once, but they are actions that are part of the human condition. They are also actions that turn us away from the love God always offers us. In this time of confession, God invites us to examine all this and to repent, which really just means to turn back. Let us confess our sins, and as we do, let us turn back. God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that our love isn't always genuine. We see evil and wring our hands instead of resisting it. We forget to consider more ways to serve you. We turn our back on strangers who could benefit from our hospitality. We do not pray enough for our enemies. We associate with our kind, fearing the other. We relish in fantasies of revenge. For all this, and for all that burdens our heart today, O oh God, we seek your forgiveness. Have mercy on us and hear our prayers. Hear these words of pardon. God's mercy extends beyond the bounds of even our collective imagination. God's love seeps through any wall we could ever put up. God's goodness holds more power than the sum of all sin. It is because of that extensive, seeping, powerful, and bold love, I declare to you in the name of the blessed and holy Trinity that God forgives all of our sins. Thanks be to God. Our scripture today comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. Leading the flock deep into the wilderness, Je Moses came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The messenger of Yahweh appeared to Moses in a blazing fire from the midst of a thorn bush. Moses saw... The bush is ablaze with fire, and yet it isn't consumed. Moses said, let me go over and look at this remarkable sight and see why the bush doesn't burn up. When Yahweh saw Moses coming to look more closely, God called out to him from the midst of the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses answered, I am here. God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. 
I am the God of your ancestors, the voice continued, the God of Sarah and Abraham, the God of Rebecca and Isaac, the God of Leah and Rachel and Jacob. Moses hid his face, afraid to look at the Holy One. Then Yahweh said, I have seen the affliction of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries under those who oppress them. I have felt their sufferings. Now I have come down to rescue them from the hand of Egypt, out of their place of suffering, and bring them to a place that is wide and fertile, a land flowing with milk and honey, the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the children of Israel has reached me, and I have watched how the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now go, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you, and that is the sign by which you will know that it is I who have sent you. After you bring my people out of Egypt, you will all worship at this very mountain. But, Moses said, when I go to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, if they ask me, what is this God's name, what am I to tell them? God replied, I am as I am. This is what you will tell the Israelites. I am has sent to you. God spoke further to Moses. Tell the children of Israel, Yahweh, the I am, the God of your ancestors, the God of Sarah and Abraham, of Rebekah and Isaac, of Leah and Rachel and Ye Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is the name you are to remember for all generations. Thank you, Bev, for reading that text. And uh, a while back, I sent the text out early, and Bev responded to me, and forgive me if I elaborate on that text. And she asked me, why Yahweh? Why that, why that word? And I went into a long history, and I said, well, you know, there are four strains of writers in the Old Testament in the Torah. One is J, one is E, one is D, and one is P. And, um, and this is from the J tradition, and the word for God is Yahweh, no vowels. It's supposed to be unpronounceable. In E, there is Elohim, which is pronounced Lord. And then she sent me back an email and said, well, I just wanted to know how to pronounce it. <laughs> and um, again, this text, and I've told this story before, but it's, it's good for those that have been around for a while. A man that I learned to love and really learned ministry from, the Reverend Arden Johnson, preached from this pulpit for over 22 years. And he shaped this community with love and with laughter and with passion. And um, he always felt a little, bit, a little bit less than because he did not have a seminary degree. He came in through the Methodist system. And I think there was a little bit of insecurity. And he was reading this text one day. And he got to the portion which Bev did so well. And the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites, and he began to stumble, and he couldn't get his place, and he said, all the other ites. <laughs> and so um, we treat this text with sacredness. It's a story that is told and told over and over again. And as we gather on this day, we are continuing in this journey, which began with Abraham and Sarah, a journey which continued and uh, in this text, it very clearly says to Moses, the God of Sarah and Abraham, the God of Rebekah and Isaac, the God of Leah and Rachel and Jacob, this God is a God who has led God's people. 
And our first introduction to Moses was last week as Moses, the baby, really without a name at that point, was placed into that basket that was sealed and placed in the Nile River. The people of Israel began to feel a sense of persecution. The Pharaoh was threatened by them and was killing every Hebrew, every Israel, Israelite boy at birth. And though God's spirit was in this, it was the princess, it was the daughter of the Pharaoh who reached out to this baby who was crying and hungry and found a nursemaid who happened to be the mother of this child. And that mother would be with this child until he was weaned. So God moved women to stand against the Pharaoh. And in the meantime, Moses grows, and he grows in stature in Egypt. He grows in power in the Pharaoh's household. He becomes an important leader. And yet he knows in his bones that he is not Egyptian. He is a part of that tribe of Israel. He has roots that go deep. His God is not the gods of the Egyptians, but his God is the only God that was the God of Abraham and Sarah. And as he's walking in the community, he notices that there is a taskmaster. And a taskmaster watches a slave, a Hebrew, an Israel slave, He watches that slave and is not satisfied with his work and begins to beat that man, beat that man almost to death. And as Moses stands there and watches, he cannot take it anymore. And we think at the age of 40 years old, Moses took on that official and he killed him. He murdered that official. And even though Moses was in the house of the Pharaoh, it was very clear that this act, this act of killing an Egyptian, would be the death of Moses. And at 40 years old, Moses fled to Midian, to the wilderness, and there he found Jethro, and there he married his his wife, his wife who'd be, who would be Zipporah. He went into the north country, I guess, to the lake country, to the wilderness, and he found himself not about politics and not about Egyptian policies and, and not even about the conflict between the Pharaoh and the Jewish people. He found himself tending sheep. He was a shepherd. And I suppose it would be a little bit like going from the president's cabinet to driving a truck. And blessed be the truck drivers, for they provide us the goods. And so normal for Moses was getting up and tending those sheep, finding fertile fields and protecting the sheep. And he began to go deeper into the wilderness and he went on to the Mount Horeb, a mountain to the Jewish people that was known to be holy. And there he saw in the distance a burning bush that was not consumed. And while that bush was burning, the people back in Egypt were crying out to God, crying out from the depths of their hearts for mercy, for rescue, for a God who would liberate them from the oppressors. And God heard their cry. And so Moses, being a curious kind of guy, he looks at that burning bush and begins to approach the bush. And as he approaches the bush, he hears a voice. And that voice says to him as he gets near, Take off your shoes, for the ground that you are standing upon is holy. 
And he took those shoes off, and as he felt those toes and soles of his feet touch the ground, he was grounded in this experience. And again, he hears the voice, I am the God of your ancestors. I'm not the Egyptian God. And I have seen the affliction of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries under those who oppress them. I have felt their sufferings, and now I have come down to rescue them from the hand of Egypt out of their place of suffering and bring them to a place that is wide and fertile, a land flowing with milk and honey. And the cry of the children of Israel has reached me, and I have watched. And now I go, and I will send you. I will send you, it's a verb, to Pharaoh to bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I imagine that was a lot for Moses to hear. Because Moses said, who am I? That I should go to the Pharaoh and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? How is that even possible? I'm a mere shepherd advancing in years. And God answered, I will be with you. I will be with you. But Moses said, when I go to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your ancestors ancestors has sent me to you, If they ask me, what is this God's name? Is it Ra? What am I to tell them? And God replied, I am as I am. I am as I choose to be. I am. I am the one God. This is what you will tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And so we have Moses on this mountain. I try to imagine what it must have been like for Moses as he was tending the sheep. As he saw this bush that did not consume itself. As he saw this messenger from God as he heard the voice of God as he tried to hide his face. And he tried to give excuses to God. I, I'm not the man. I, I can't do this. And God said, I will be with you. And this is the story that is the story of liberation. And we know that the next time that Moses leaves Egypt, he will be 80 years old. So this journey, this process of being a shepherd and discovering this God, it took a long time for this to assimilate. It took a long time for Moses to muster that courage to go back to the Pharaoh, to go back to to the land of Egypt as a criminal. But God had heard the cries of God's people, And God responded by calling Moses and Aaron, the brother of Moses, to go back to Egypt to let my people go. So in the midst of our time, I wonder, does God hear the cries of those who are in intensive care afflicted by COVID? Does God hear the cries of those who awaited Laura's arrival on the Gulf Coast, the winds that that ravaged that land and caused some death? Does God hear the voices and the cries of the people of color as they continue to be sought out and killed? 
And I think we can all ask ourselves as we ask these questions, does God hear the cries of God's people? And I would hope the answer is, of course, God hears those cries. But then the next question is, who is Moses? Where is Moses that will set God's people free? Whether they are refugees or whether they are children that are separated from families or whether they are families that are in distress financially and emotionally and spiritually, whether it is the people who have been oppressed over and over again and just every time they try to get up, they are slapped down. God hears those cries, but where? Where is Moses? Was Moses Martin Luther King Jr.? Was Moses Mahatma Gandhi? Was Moses Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the Nazi criminal camps, the concentration camps? Was, was Moses Oscar Romero in El Salvador as Oscar Romero was gunned down as he served the Mass? Moses, as he was a shepherd, he knew that he was really a lowly creature. There's, there was nothing he could do to rescue his people, even though he felt their pain and even though he knew that they suffered, he was safe in Midian in the mountains tending sheep. What could he do? He was just a small person. Yet God called Moses and said, I will go with you. And I suspect that as we listen to this text again, as we relive, reimagine what it must have been like for the Hebrew people, we can imagine ourselves standing in their shoes. Perhaps we can even imagine ourselves standing with the feet of Moses on that bare ground. We perhaps can imagine the voice of God saying to us, I want you to confront the Pharaoh. And I know you don't feel very strong, and I know you don't feel very capable, but I want you to confront the Pharaoh. And I think all of us can imagine who that Pharaoh is. We can imagine that that Pharaoh is our systems that have simply gone wrong. We can imagine the Pharaoh being a world economy that really elevates the privileged and the wealthy and yet disregards the poor. We can imagine the Pharaoh even being FEMA who when the hurricane strikes, their target is how do we begin to lift up the middle class? How do we begin to rebuild and establish their businesses again? But too often the poor are given a ticket, a one-way ticket, to fly to Detroit. We can imagine the Pharaoh even being ourselves. But what we know to be true is that God hears the cries of those who are oppressed. God hears. And as Moses experienced that bush, he stood back with a curiosity, aware that this was a holy encounter. And that curiosity invited him to engage in a conversation with the holy, and he even challenged the holy. He said, I can't do this. If just one of us, or maybe a half a dozen of us, here heard this text and said, says to God, I am here. I am here. What? would you have me do? 
How, God, will we let our people go? I think what our times have told, told us is we have a lot of unfinished work. That the sins of our fathers and mothers from generations past are being visited upon us. The undone work of justice and equality. The undone work of economies that are uneven, the undone work of racism that permeates our culture, and it's not just here in America. And I do believe that God is calling us, as God called Moses, to step forward, to know that we are not alone, to know that we can begin to build a foundation in which real change will occur. We can build a foundation in which the oppressed will be released and they'll cross that sea again and the waters will be parted and they will be set free. But even then, the work is still not, it's still not done. So let us ponder and let us hear this text. Let us also have curiosity and wonderment. And let us place ourselves in that wilderness. When we hear our name called out. And when we respond, I am here. Thanks be to God. Amen. We will turn to a, it's a classic hymn, and we're going to sing two verses of it. It's when Israel was in Egypt's land. This past week, the conference minister for the Minnesota Conference of the United Church of Christ, and for those who are not UCC, she's sort of like a bishop without any power. In the United Church of Christ, the power is within the local congregation. And our conference ministers have the power to recommend and the power to join in, and we are in covenant with them. But the Reverend Sherry Prestonman came to us a number of years ago. I happened to sit on the board of directors when we hired her. We knew that she was a hot commodity and she would be swooped up by another conference if we did not hire her, and we have never regretted that move. She came to us from Back Bay Mission, 
And Back Bay Mission is our only presence in Louisiana. It's on the shore, and its mission is to minister to the poor. And often those poor are the fishermen and the people that work in the communities. And she happened to be at Back Bay Mission when Katrina moved through, and when they woke up that next day, every building on their campus was flattened. And she knows the power of hurricanes and of devastation. She also knows the power of the community of God. So it was this, in the middle of this week that she sent this prayer out, and I did send it out to folks, and so it may be familiar to you, but I would like to use this time of prayer to give voice to Sherry's words. She first began by saying, by quoting Rainier Maria Rilke, be patient with all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. And the point is to live everything. Let us pray. O oh God of infinite grace and generous loves, our hearts tremble as storms rage around us. As Hurricane Laura, Laura sweeps onto the coasts of Texas and Louisiana, we bow our heads in prayer to you. Sit with all those who wait and watch this night huddled in attics, sheltered for safety, fearing for their lives. Hold close all those in harm's way whose homes and neighborhoods and businesses and lives face utter devastation of brutal water and wind. Grant your blessed guidance to all those who will rush to help and heal in the midst of disaster to all those who will follow in the weeks and the months to come to recover and repair what has been lost. In your mercy, O God, hear our prayer. And O God, who grants peace beyond all understanding, we pray for the peace of our cities, for Minneapolis and Kenosha and Louisville, and all places teeming with rage and unrest. Give us the wisdom to understand the source of the rage, the ears to hear and the eyes to see hard truths, the passion to seek justice when injustice has been done, the prophetic courage to name the evils of racism and needless, senseless death, strength to those who must lead amid complexity and pain, the will to change, love enough to overcome hatred and division, vision and determination enough to invite a new future. O oh, great healer, balm to our souls, we pray for a nation and a world still gripped by COVID, for family, families and friends of over 180,000 loved ones, who have perished in our nation alone, for workers who are essential and workers who have lost jobs, for teachers and children and college students and parents as school years began, for pastors and chaplains and all who strive to lend comfort, for all those, all whose anxiety and fear overwhelms and bears down. God, grant, God of grace and glory, rise within us like the words of the hymn our hearts still dare to sing. Grant us wisdom. Grant us courage for the facing of this hour. Still the storms around us and within us. Lend us the courage that fa fails us and the hope that escapes us. Though our voices may tremble and our world may rumble, our faith is in you. Merciful God holds fast, and it is in your powerful name that we pray all of this. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear this call to offering good folk. If we pay pay close enough attention when we look around, all we can see is need. But is that how you think God sees it? I think that God, as God looks around, God sees the need, yes, but God also sees a great abundance. God sees all the gifts God has already given us, and God sees opportunity. As a church, we are invited to look around through that same lens, seeing opportunities and gifts and possibilities around us while acknowledging the deep needs that surround us. Each person has something to give, and each person has a need. I invite you to prayerfully reach within yourself, acknowledging a need you bring today, recognizing that every person around you brings a need as well. As a church, it is our job, our calling, to join together and meet those needs. Share them with us and we will receive them prayerfully. And as the offering is gathered in your homes, I invite you to acknowledge in your giving that you have a gift to share. And I invite you to share that gift generously trusting that the people around you will do the same. Share your gifts with us, and we will receive them gratefully. Today's offerings of needs and gifts will now be received with gratitude. And you can make a donation to this church, this community, by going to www.uccwalker.com, and there will be a donate button that will lead you to give as much as you desire. Let us dedicate these gifts. In your creation, O God, we stand on the holiest of ground. May these gifts be a blessing to all that you have made. May the church, organizations, and people that receive them act as your hands. May needs be seen and met, and may the giving fit the need. Through Christ, who models infinite giving. Amen.
I want to thank the, uh, and Sonia, you need to stay up here, you're not finished. <laughs> I want to thank Barb and Sonia and Linda and, and Bev and Mike and Joanna who directed for this uh, wonderful music. And I know that as you are at home, you're standing with a standing ovation. Thank you so much. Uh, they will lead us in the hymn, and you sing along, Savior, again to your da dear name. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and within you and from you. May that light emerge. And may you know peace that is beyond understanding. That as the Moseses arise today, that you will go into the world loving kindness, doing justice, and walking humbly with one another, and with God, go in peace. Amen. Amen.